getting something made is always about the person, not about the machine. Business of Architecture, episode 363. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week, I have the good privilege of speaking with not one, but not two, but three uh, directors of Billings Jackson Design. Now, Billings Jackson is an industrial design firm and they're working at the interface of construction and product manufacturing. Uh, They work very closely with architects. They serve the construction industry, the firm itself has got offices in London, New York, and Chicago. They work on high-profile urban and transport infrastructure, as well as designing products for market-leading manufacturers. And I'm actually speaking with Duncan Jackson and Owen Billings, who are the original co-founders of Billings Jackson. And Duncan is an engineer and a furniture designer by trainer by training. Um, and founded the business in 1992 with Owen in London. And Owen is also an industrial designer, and he has the main responsibility for the firm's work in Europe and the Middle East. And joining them is Simon Christak, who is the director of the New York office, and he is responsible for the day-to-day management of Billings Jackson's projects uh, and engagement across North America. So really interesting to be able to sit down with Um, the two co-founders and uh, main director of the business who's been there for many, many years to listen to how the business has evolved, how it's been growing, their understanding and explanation of what industrial design is, how it sits in and works alongside other industries in construction, other disciplines within the construction industry, and also for them to reflect upon how their leadership has grown, how the office has evolved, and how they have navigated obstacles, recessions, and economic growth over the last 20 plus years. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Simon Christak, Duncan Jackson, and Owen Billings. Owen, Simon, Duncan, welcome to the Business of Architecture. What a delight it is. You are the, the first industrial design practice that I've um, spoken with and had on the show and it's brilliant to be able to speak with um, a practice of your of your caliber and expertise and it's been around and it's got that kind of the amount of contribution that you've you've already given to the industry and to have all three of you here together and tell your story is a delight so welcome welcome to the show thank you thanks for having us my pleasure thanks Ryan. so I, I guess the first question really is how do you describe industrial design and how does it fit into the, the making of a building? But I think the, we've, we've been working at that, at describing how that works for many, many years, because it's very, it's a very difficult question to, to answer actually, or was, or we found, we found a way. So we, what, because we're industrial designers um, at our, at, at our base, and we're, but we're industrial designers and architects working together in, in, mm. in the practice. But but we, because industrial design is where we come from, and manufacturing, working with manufacturing, working with process, because we work with the manufacturers, we sort of magpie uh, ideas and knowledge and and, mar- and understanding across into the the building projects, and and vice versa. Um, so the big advantage to say where we're working with a big architectural team is that we're, we're able to find, we're able to bring the cut, latest cutting edge kind of technology and the way the market is going, like in, in lighting technology or uh, any, sort of any manufactured object, furniture, elements, cladding, systems sometimes, but anything that we work on, we're, we're able to, we have a process through industrial design process to, to delve into how things are done and what's the best way forward? And, and we often will do a, a, a process of finding the, the 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 right manufacturer for the job. Mm. Um, so that I, that's ha- yeah. Sorry. Well, no, I was just going to say that when when we first set up the office in uh, New York, um, the commissioner for the DDC, um, David Burney, who's who was a, a Brit as well. It came, we, you know, I asked to talk to him about how 
how we can work with the city. And, and he said, I don't, I don't get what industrial design is in, in the building industry because as far as I'm concerned, it's kettles and posters <laughs> and, and white goods and stuff. And, uh, so, and he said, Look, until you can articulate what industrial design can offer to the building industry, it's going to be difficult because you're not a consultant that's on the list. You know, mm-hmm. you've got lighting design, you've got landscape architects, you've got all of the, the um, subcontract, subconsultants that make up the team. And so it's taken a while to craft a narrative of what industrial design can offer and it 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 does actually come down to getting the detail that you want Mm. on a building because if you can draw it and you can specify it it's harder for the trade contractors to deviate and so that's in a way the in a very kind of knotty bit is we're able to draw what can be made and specify what can be made to a a degree that is ordinarily not necessarily taken care of in the building process into the way that drawings are, are drawn. So you, you get to a certain point, uh, not that we would ha- we have to draw further, it's just the, making sure that the materials can be folded in that way, all of those things that help, uh, help deliver the actual object as desired. And I think mm. that's sort of uh, one of the roles that we've, we've carved out and it's not easy because obviously that's um that's something that's in depends on the way the contracts put together it's it's a very interesting scale that you work at as an industrial designer because i suppose you're it's different or you you, you can explain it's different from say an architectural product which tends to be a one-off bespoke item and it's not quite the same as say kettles and things which are con- for consumer which is like mass production it sort of fits somewhere in the middle mm. yeah maybe simon you could talk about the uh, work that we did improving this the new york metro because that's the most recent thing and simon was looking after that and that that's a good example of somewhere in between yeah um so um one of the projects that we've been working on is for the MTA, which is the sort of transit agency in New York City. They run the subways, they run the commuter rail systems. Mm-hmm. Um, and one of the things that they have to do is improve their system, their signals, there's all sorts of things, but they've been looking at it from a customer experience perspective as well, improving stations. If you've been to New York anytime in the last 20 years, you've probably seen stations that look like they're from the Warriors movie, you know, um, they, a lot of them haven't been improved. Um, there's water stains, there's leaks. So there's a lot of infrastructure issues that, that are in some of the stations. Mm. And so what they were doing is while they were going in to fix some of those sort of intrinsic structural problems and improve the station structurally, they figured, Hey, why, while we're here, why don't we do something about the sort of the, the customer experience as well and improve those things. And so, um, we, we were working on a number of the objects that were arrayed across those stations. And um, we managed to, um, to sort of work with every team. So they parsed these out. They did like 20 some odd stations in batches of three and four stations a piece. And so we were able to carry the thread of objects from across all those 20 stations because they were procuring it vertically, you know, for packages of stations, but we and the several other sub consultants were the common thread across all right. those stations. And that way we were able to get the economies of scale and the quality and the detail that really MTA wanted um, to create new standard products, right? If you go into a transit station in almost any city, you're going to see a standard issue bench or a standard issue trash can or, uh, you know, um, real time information displays mm. and what have you. MTA didn't have the appetite to sort of try and pre-design those things. And so they used this project to basically establish prototypes, stress test, and develop the products from first principles all the way through. So now there's projects that we're not involved in that are specifying the bench, the trash can, the information displays, some of the stuff and the equipment that we developed for these stations um, using the big sort of infrastructure project as a way to leverage 
that opportunity to create new standards for the next hundred years for this for the MTA. And, and and when you've got a relationship like that, where you've kind of given the design DNA, or you've done a, a kind of you've, you've worked out a series of objects and products for for a system, and then the client goes and reuses them, do you get continual? Do you get royalties on on these types of products and bits of design, or how does it typically work in terms of how how the the business model works? No, I mean, you know, in, in the building industry, and this is, I guess, if you come back to what, what is the building industry offer, and mm. it, the, it's the only industry in the world that doesn't uh, invest in an intellectual property because it, it's only copyright on the drawing. So there is no, uh, generally the clients own all the IP uh, and they never reuse it. You know, if you buy, if you, you know, if you build a factory, you draw it to your specification, it gets drawn for your use and then you'll never, you know, unless you do another one. I mean, there are exceptions to that, but um, no, there's no, the, the intellectual property is owned by the client it, and the, um, the use of the intellectual property is literally the copyright on the drawing. So there is no, uh, there's no royalty based um, work that can only really come from a manufacturer who is yeah. supplying on a commercial, a commercially open contract to a to a to a project. So, if they want to invest in developing a product and then pitch that product into the building procurement process, that's generally how that can happen. And it's quite hard, particularly with publicly funded projects, yeah. to 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 do anything where it would be a a direct purchase of an object. It's only private projects where a private individual says, I want to have a poltrona frau this and I will pay my architect, you know, the time it takes him to go to poltrona frau and say, we'd like to, you to design this and have it in our, you know, museum. And then there may be a royalty agreement done, made between the designer and the, and the manufacturer. Mm. And I, I hope that makes Yes, yes, sense. that's, that's, that's clear. How, how did, um, how did the business begin? Well, uh, yeah, very quickly, um, I set up my own company in 1988, um, making furniture, um, got a project with, uh, Nick Grimshaw asked me if I would work on a project for Herman Miller. And that's why I'm actually now in the Midwest, but that's another story altogether. Um, Owen and I started working together in, in 1990. Um, that project sort of uh, finished in t kind of 92, no, no, yeah, about 92. And then Owen and I set up Billings Jackson in 1992 and started doing work, uh, obviously doing some work for the building industry for Grimshaws. And we developed relationships. And that's really, to be frank, that's the only way that products come out of the building industry is through mm. relationships and you know, you, you, you could probably know that from, say, facade development. You know, you get relationship with Permis de Lisa. As an architect, you develop, you know, nice solutions and they, you start developing a language of, of your type, style of, of, of facade. And it goes the same way for, uh, for other objects and stuff. And, and then I, I guess in uh, Owen and I worked on buildings and products. And then we, uh, we set up the New York office when we did the street furniture for New York City um, and that was in uh, 2003 and uh, Simon joined us shortly after that thereafter and we've grown grown the business in those two centers um, but that's that's one minute of how, how we came about um, well, it's it's an interest it's a it, we're unusual we had unusual kind of birth in that in that uh, Duncan came from engineering originally and then did furniture design. And if you ever work with furniture designers, it's super down into the detail. You know, it's like how an upholstery piece works. And uh, and I I had come actually. My father was a was a cladding uh, consultant. He kind of started the whole facade consultancy industry. He was one of mm. the first because um, we, we used to make in a little tiny factory in Ireland we used to make stuff for Rogers and, and Foster and, um, 
uh, and then they outgrew our factory and then but they didn't stop sending faxes this will tell you how long ago faxes <laughs> still kept coming with the questions you know how, <laughs> so how do you do this you know and so i had this exposure to uh we had test prototype facades in the garden you know that kind of thing and and uh, and then my father actually met duncan and it was through my father that I, duncan and i got together uh, I did some really terrible technical drawings for the interview, but I still managed to get through. And then, uh, we... It's the storytelling. It's the storytelling. Yeah. <laughs> it's the story. I think it was actually my orange juice squeezer that cracked it. It was, I was really bad at that. Uh, um, so I worked for Duncan on the Herman Miller project, which was such a buzz to work on because we, were, we worked directly with Nick Grimshaw. So was this, we... this for the factory? No, it, this no, was the it furniture. Was the furniture. Was actually the furniture, okay. Yeah, and it, it it evolved a philosophy, and it was really it really strong. And but I, but I guess, I guess I was actually listening to Duncan. I was thinking about the business of industrial design and architecture. Mm. And one thing I knew for certain was that my father had designed and patent had didn't have patents, but he had designed many patent glazing systems, and had never earned a sovereign of any of them, mm. um, because unless he were the actual manufacturer. You, you didn't really get very much. And, and um, the building industry inherently doesn't have any respect for ideas, even though it's brimming with ideas. It's absolutely brimming. Um, mm. uh, they are many just washed away and lost and, 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 or, or, or taken. And because there isn't a real commercial return, recognizable commercial return for a very good building product if you like in in terms of a facade system for example mm. there's very few people w willing to invest and it's very hard to protect so so what simon and duncan and i work on is in fact systemization for a project right and and we use the the mass producers uh, skills um to, 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 to bring, to bring de-risk the project, bring value, bring it faster. Um, but what, what we began to do that no other industrial designer had, had done was we did start talking to manufacturers of ceramics tile systems, about making cladding systems. And we came close a few times to having some quite interesting long-term products. But it's really difficult to 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 develop products for building a building. Um, actually, if I can go on a bit, when yeah. Duncan, if you remember, we were we were hired to work on a terminal two uh, for Heathrow, and we were part of a team uh, included um, Arabs, Grimshaw, a few others to to. And it had been kicked off by Foster and the airport had realized that they, 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 they were going to have X number of kilometers of, of airport terminal as, it, as in the gates arrangements um, over the next 12 years. And that in fact, the volume was such that effectively they were making this enormous product. And I was brought in to be the product designer with the architectural team. And it was the, the first thing I said to them was that none of these are, pro you're not building products. Buildings are not products. They mm. have always site specific. They're always, you know, you're, you're nearly structurally stepping across a river, finding places to land on the ground. It all varies. It's very, very site specific. Um, and if you know anything about physics, it, even the earth, the earthing of the building is specific to the quality of the ground that it sits on. Yeah. And so, so the real skills a product designer can bring to a building is in the systemization of the repeated elements that go throughout the building. But it's not just mechanics. And that was where in airports we worked on terminal uh, to the check-in desk. It's mm -hmm. also about people. Because the difference with a building and an architect that I've noticed, and it took me a while to see this and understand because I, I was trained in industrial design. You, you, the first thing you think about is what? The end user. It's yeah. about the human experience of the object. And if you don't get that right, you haven't got an object. There's no one going to make it. It's a, it's a complete waste of time. Mm. Um, but when I work with major developers, like we worked with in, in London 
uh, where we were bringing out sort of human story to a, the building of a building and about the importance of detail, they were talking about square meter rates and square footage rates and very little about uh, other than, and they lifted entirely in the architect to bring the qualities that would yeah. make the space good for people. And of course they should, they should. But, but when you're working with say a manufacturer on a product, that comes from the very top. It's the, it, the product has to be extraordinary in whatever its main thing is, whether it's price, quality, you know, functionality, whatever it is, yeah. uh, and usually it's free. Um, that starts at the very, very, very beginning. So, and then the building, it sort of oddly doesn't, because it mm. kind of starts with how much can we get away with on this particular <laughs> site? You know, what can we do? And how much money can we get for it? And it kind of comes from there. So, and not always, of course, but often. And, and, um, and, uh, uh, so I, what I, I've realized is that that human element is, is, the, is the key difference where we start with people. Mm. And, and the, 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 heat, the check-in desk was the perfect example because all the artists that were working on the project went, rang us up and said, could you work on this, please? And we were thinking, oh, that's very really kind of them. It was very sweet that they you know, pushed us forward. And it was. It was very kind. I, I am grateful for anyone listening. <laughs> uh, but, but, but at the same time, they did not want to go near it. Because yeah. it, this was the point where all the airlines and all of the, the, and the, and the operators and the owners all met. It's the, it's the, it's the hot point of where it could go wrong, uh, you know, at, where they'd have disputes with one another. Mm. Um, because uh, in this case, it was 27 airlines at the time. We're, using, we're sharing check-in desks. So it'd be Can Air Canada one minute. And then the next bunch might be uh, SAS, you know, the, the, the Scandinavian airlines. And, and you, you couldn't imagine two more different airlines. Mm. And then they're all, they're all being supplied by one system integrator who's doing all the tech, if you like, you know, all the actual ticket machines. And then you've got Heathrow Limited who are supplying it all and, pe- and charging the rent for it. And so you've got this sort of place where it could all go really wrong. So Duncan came up with a, we, you know, we started sketching and doing ideas about what it might look and feel like and don't just wait there whoa whoa just no right who is it we have to please and we're like, well 27 different airlines it's like okay well, we need to meet them and we're like what the people that work behind the counter and don't go yes i'm gonna do that so he he, he got all these old bits and things we had for making mock-ups and things and we created a check-in desk in our studio Brilliant. and we invited the, they selected people that worked right on the coal face and worked with customers mm. to come in with, with their management. And we had Heathrow's customer experience people there at the same time. And we ran a process with them and we, we introduced them to their own desk and explained to them, Do you, you know, the way you have a lot of conflict, like quite far away, there's a big desk in between you and your customer. And also if, if you want to help with the bags, so I know you don't, policy wise you may not want to but sometimes you do and and, and you want to have a you're you can't do that you have to climb out of this cockpit you know to get to to your customer or your guests depending on how you want to address them and so while we were there, we made it all out of just cardboard we made it look like no one had designed anything it was yep. very very crude deliberately so and introduced them in, and we started pulling the whole thing open and moving the desk away and started asking them, do you feel how does that feel you know i'm you know, I'm the guest, you're looking after me. And what about the reach for the bag? And what do you do with the ticket machines? And we found some fabulous stories, like the ticket machines jam, mm-hmm. the paper. Eventually, you get little <laughs> tufty bits of paper in the jams machine. So one woman said, well, you know, that won't work, what you're suggesting. And I was like, well, why is that? Well, because I have to be able to pick the machine up about six inches off the deck and then drop it in order for all the paper to knock out of all the wheels. <laughs> now, nobody in operations from the airport had ever seen this or knew this happened to their equipment. So they were, they were kind of freaked out. But apparently it was a regular occurrence. But uh, that's a bit anecdotal, but it's kind of an example of there's very key details about the lives of those people working behind the desk, how they relate to the customers, which a sort of industrial design process sort of un- unmasked and, un- and revealed. Mm. And we hadn't drawn anything. We hadn't done any conceptual design work at all. And then it, it, was, it was very well received um, because they felt included in the process. They felt part of it. They weren't just told one day, you know, you're at this new desk, there you go. 
and and uh, I think it was it was a very successful process for Heathrow themselves mm. because they're dealing with this multi-headed, very difficult customer. So, and, that, and that was an example of where industrial design process can really help on a complicated multi-stakeholder kind of issue, and 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 we can get through get through the other the other side of it. And we very similar with cities, and I know Simon is currently working on some secret stuff with the New York Underground, where there's there's one object and 50 people <laughs> making decisions about it. You know? well, I think what's funny, Owen, is when you're saying that, is that how many times we, we might have design ideas, but that we deliberately make it look like we haven't designed anything because we're not trying to get people's reaction to a design, which people can put all sorts of flags on the ground about what something looks like. And it also evokes very emotional responses to things mm. and brings out sort of layers of politics and things like that, that we're not trying to ascertain or find out. What we're trying to find out is, is this thing doing what it's meant to do? Is it achieving its goals? Is it serving the end result or end users, you know, in the way it's supposed to. So we, it's funny when you're saying that, cause I'm sort of saying, yeah, we always do that where we sort of don't, don't make it look like it's designed, you know, cause we don't want to provoke any comments. We're trying to get to the root of, of the design problem. And then we can, we've been talking about things in terms of harmony and harmonize it with an environment or with the architectural vision or what other, other things. But first we have to solve the root problem. And that's what Owen was sort of talking about is that mm. if you don't get that right at the outset, it doesn't matter how much lipstick you can put on it. You know, it's, it's still a pig, you know, it's still not going to work. It's not going to do what, um, what it's meant to do. Well, it's, it's really interesting how you're describing that process of navigating through those complex multi-headed corporate clients and how, you know, I've, I, I was at uh, Grimshaw for a while and worked on many uh, airport infrastructure projects. And that was a very, that was an art in itself was being able to, you know, you've got massive amounts of stakeholders and everyone's got a, and then, and those stakeholders are not necessarily even talking to themselves either. And you as a designer are now in a position where you're kind of getting lots of different opinions and you're making a decision over here about something and then you've got to present the same decision to another group of stakeholders. So if you've got this, the, the focus on the, the, the end user at mind, that's a kind of a very powerful anchor point. Yeah. Cause you can be a, cause you, like you said, I mean, what ends up happening is that sometimes the, the design object or even you as a design professional become the proxy of some sort of quasi um, battle that's going on in, within the administration of a large organization that, you know, oh, person X doesn't like it, so person Y is going to like it. Just because person X and person Y don't get along or there's there's some other thing going on that you're not even privy to. Mm. And so we find ourselves in, so it, you know, and, and a lot of design professionals find themselves in the sort of, you know, in the firing line of these sort of things, but navigating that and sort of, you know, we talk about de-risking projects in terms of how we design and develop details and all of this and having something that's predictable in terms of quality and cost, you know, but there's also de-risking the approvals process, right? And so it is sort of taking the design philosophy all the way and running it to the ground, you know, how do we get something done? And we have to design that process as much as we have to design mm. the actual object that we're, that we're working on. Well, what are the sort of criteria that you use to ass assess the success of your designs afterwards? Well, I would, what I would say is, is in terms of the, um, there's obviously cost in terms of the procurement of them. Mm -hmm. you know, did we meet that? The quality um, of the object. And because we're looking at a, a lot of the infrastructure projects, it, it can be, you know, 10, 20 years that you find out whether something's been successful because of its maintenance regimes and all of those. But I, I would say that the, the utility of the design within the project and was it um, altered and did it cause, there was there any cost implication in the design approach taken has to be met and, and uh, as, a, as a success point. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say repeat business in the sense that, you know, in, in, people, um, people come back if, if we've been successful and if we haven't, they won't ask us again. And in, in, you're only as good as your last project. And so I think that where we operate 
we, we, we have long, long-term relationships with the people that we work with. And I, and I guess the, um, the, the aspect of collaboration is that in terms of sort of the su- reducing, reducing the conflict of delivering quality is what, what I would say is successful. So if you've delivered something of quality and it hasn't been so painful that you'll never do it again, then you've been successful. And um, I mean, one of the things that I find, in, well, there's a dichotomy between industrial design in the built environment and industrial design as a, a sort of product. Yeah. Is that in, in product design, you know, say you're designing a shoe or, or whatever it is, you have a distinct set of criteria that has to be met for the user. As Owen said, the user is the person who buys it, right? In the, in the built environment, the user never buys the industrial design, right? It's that the user, although they are very important and that they have to be considered because that's what you want industrial design to, to wash over this built environment is to say, we, we have touch points. You know, uh, Owen was, I mean, Owen said years ago, when you walk into a building, what's your first experience of walking into that building? It's probably touching the door handle. And if mm-hmm. that doesn't work really well, You've already set a kind of motion in motion the feeling of the quality of your environment just because of that literal ex- that experience of of opening the door, and that you know is something that is cared for through a very very massive team of people who are put, trying to put this building together. Whereas choosing the end tabs on the on a lace for a for a shoe has a very small ma- 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 number of people that have to make a decision about that. You yeah. know, it may be difficult and it, it may be challenging personally or, you know, but in terms of the whole o- overall aspiration, everyone's pulling in the same direction. Yeah. They, they all want a successful product. In the building industry, it's not necessarily that obvious what the direction is be- being pulled in. And I mean, when, when you get to the procurement, I mean, the stories that you have about how, contractors make money on doing buildings it may be nothing at all to do with the end product it may be if we have a disorganized project team we will have people sitting around doing nothing and we can charge money for them doing nothing every day but they're actually working on another site i mean you you don't know how people make money in the building industry and it certainly isn't directed towards the end user's experience so so that's the difference and i I would say that the the I mean, getting back to your question, which is how do you ascertain quality? I, mm. I have to say it's to do with the slow progress of, first of all, from our point of view, convincing people that industrial design has a value in the building industry, which 20 years ago was kind of hard. Yep. And slowly people paying attention to those details. And the other thing I'd say is that getting those details right doesn't usually cost the project any more money. Yeah, that, that's what that's what I wanted to that's what I wanted to say is that there's this there's this aspect of it where there's this idea about um, there's risk aversion and there's concerns about cost and those things conspire to um, let's say over catalog a building or or a project where someone says I want something off the shelf you know because mm. I I know what it's going to cost and I know it's available but the the fact is and maybe it's not it's not a dirty secret it's that most things now are made to order. You know, there's not some factory sitting in Trenton, New Jersey or, you know, Shropshire or wherever that has a billion of an object that have been pre-made and they're going to ship it to you, drop ship it to you. It's just like anything else now, t-shirts or anything else. It, things are made to order. Mm. And so, I mean, there's a story when Duncan, you know, we were working for the DOT and we had to design this, this bench for these things, these sort of bus bulbs, they call them, but they were bump outs that were on Broadway for a buses to come. So they didn't have to n- navigate in and out of traffic. Right. And it was the beginning of sort of reconsidering some of the, um, the transit sort of, especially the surface bus transit um, infrastructure in New right. York city, but they had designed it where they'd put this fence up on the back, which became a prime location for people to hang their wares to, to, for selling along Broadway in New York and also made it that 
N nobody who was, you know, disabled people couldn't get onto the bus bulb. You know, it was just one of these things. Like it was put there to stop people from falling in this ditch because they didn't want to redo the street because of hydrology reasons. But it was just one of these design things that they basically, no, no one looked 10 feet past the problem and mm. they kept solving short-term problems without looking holistically at it. Yeah. So we get parachuted into a lot of projects like this. Um, where, where there's a problem or something's happened and then they, we get a phone call saying, can you, can you help us, you know, sort of come up with a sensitive, um, light touch cost effective sort of remedy. Help. Yeah. Help. <laughs> help, help. help us. Can, can you help please? Yeah. For the love of all that's good. Um, so of course we agreed, um, and we designed this grading system that, that basically bridged the gap, um, and allowed people to get from one edge to the other, but there was a step because the bus bulb was higher than the sidewalk. And there was a historic sidewalks that were these giant stones that were placed down. God knows we, we speculated how they, how they even got those things in the place. Mm. So we decided, you know what, there's nowhere to sit, right? If you go to New York on Broadway, there's little spikes on everything because back in the seventies and eighties, vagrants would be, you know, doing whatever they were doing on in front of stores and no one liked it. But it's no longer that New York. Um, mm. So people should have a, a, a place to sit. So we designed a bench. But the commissioner at the time, which is Jeanette Sadek Khan, she said, you know, how much is this going to cost? You know, the bench is going to be, you know, so much money, whatever. And Duncan said, it's not, I guarantee, and this is where we all got a bit nervous, you know, but he's like, I guarantee it'll be less than $5,000 for, a, you know, a bench. And it was she's like, oh, 2000 Two thousand. Sorry, it was it was less than five thousand for a for a pair of benches. Um, because they the way that they anyway. Um, so we all sort of. I mean, I looked at him and you know, okay. And he she said, I'm going to hold you to that. You know, in in the commissioner's boardroom, and then we went about manufacturing it. Back to the case of having a relationship. We had a relationship with a manufacturer that we'd worked with to develop other products, a product that's found in many airports, for example. Mm. And we went to them and told them about the opportunity and we designed a bench in tandem with them to deliver and it came in under the budget. And so those benches are on Broadway right now. There's not a lot of them, but it became a catalog item. It became something that then could be something that was quote off the shelf. Right. Like a lot of products are developed to be off that you see are now catalog products were never intended to be catalog items. They were solving a specific design problem that you realize through this process is that we're solving over and over again, right? Mm. So if you design, design it once and you de develop a solution once, likely <laughs> there's going to be another application for that somewhere else. And that's what the manufacturers take a punt on. They've invested in the tooling, that's the cost that they had to invest in, and then they just have the tools. And if you order one, they make one for you. On and in. so I think there's this sort of mythology about off the shelf that there's some, like Owen would say, that there's some inventor out there, you know, anticipating every need of everything and they're de de developing these things and that you're going to get the cost benefit because you're just going to phone up. Those things have been developed by industrial designers and by other designers during a process and it becomes a catalog item. And so that's how, it, that's how it can work. So we, you know, to take it back to the ESI or some other things like that, it's like we said, now we've developed new catalog items. Now some designer 20 years down the road may be fighting the battle saying, Billy, you know, that wasn't a catalog item when they, Billings Jackson <laughs> designed it or something, you know I mean? And now it is. Um, so it's, it's hard to change it once it is, but it's not impossible to get there if, as Duncan said, it doesn't necessarily cost mm -hmm. you any more money. Um, to get there, it's just the process and knowing the process. So, so, so where where is the the sort of the best entry point for you into a project? Because it's quite interesting you were saying there about how sometimes it can be quite reactionary in terms of the client needing a, a, a help. We need to fix this, and then if we look at the lifespan of say you know like T five in the UK, that was a twenty five year long project uh, which is which is you know extraordinary and a lot of a lot of infrastructure projects particularly in the uk and i'm, I'm sure in the us it's probably a similar sort of uh you know kind of complex process where is where is a good point for you to be entering into i think we the, the, the big thing and, and simon and, and duncan will attest to this in particular simon recently has been doing a lot in the last year or so i would say uh is in the bid process where we work with consultant teams and we form a part of the team. I mean, some very significant um, consultants and contractors 
sort of use us as, as a, a bit of front end, uh, we add a bit of a difference. Um, so, so just, just from a marketing and, and communications point of view, uh, using our skills and with our portfolio, it can, uh, it promises another level of detail, which the client is, is demanding, you know, particularly on big infrastructure projects where they're now where customer and guest experience is so important to their product, you know, which is their selling, um, um, their, their airport or their hub or their railway or whatever it is. So, so we, we, we often, that's our best entry point because we're in the very early, uh, we were part of the, part of the team. Um, in fact, on, I don't know if anyone has said so far, we, we have been invited to be on all the teams going for some bids to, because sometimes the, the customer wants us in the end, uh, and, and they, they want voice on their contractor, but they might want us just to make sure the detail goes through. Um, so, so we're, we're, we, we can be, we, we're usually very good on the, on the bid process and that, that's where it gets us, um, a good seat at the table where we can make a difference because mm. then we can work from the beginning where, where we've done the kind of emergency work is, um, often with, uh, I would say New York city is a really good example of, Oh God help <laughs> and where they've a really thorny issue and, and they've got to get it past the design commission, which is a, an official body that will not approve things, to, will only approve things that go on the street and Duncan yeah. worked hugely with them and they, there's a great deal of trust there, I think. Well, one of the, one of the challenging projects we had in New York, um, which was very, um, slightly mundane, which was, um, um, the city had banned the use of chain link fence on bridges and right. what areas where you would want to prevent people throwing objects onto other, um, other roadways or, or p pavements. And so they were trying to figure out how to, to you, to come up with a system that was economic. And so they, you know, chain link fence is a, you know, rudimentary product. And so we, we, um, we were handed this hot potato. We didn't realize what it was. You know, someone said, Hey, those guys, why don't you look at this? And so we said, Oh, great. And we didn't realize the politics behind it or anything. It was been going on for years. So, um, I, I, I mean, I could feel the hand on my back after I said it, it was it, well, why don't we use chain link fence? And I didn't realize it had been banned. Right. So, <laughs> and so, and the, and the, and the department of transport said, that's a really good idea. We think you should do. So we, we basically had to reinvent the use of chain link fence in protecting uh, barriers. And, and mm. so we, we just re, recalibrated the use of it because the, the idea was that we wanted something that, because it gets damaged. When you use like wire, welded wire frame, people cut it out and use it uh, <coughs> for their um, barbecues, right? Yeah. And then they patch it and it starts looking pretty, pretty bad. And, and that, and you know, nobody replaces it. So we said, well, okay, chaining fence obviously has an institutional characteristic. So can we change the way it feels and looks? So we, we treated it as a textile because it is woven. Mm -hmm. And we, we actually then stretched the textile in, in panels rather than going a hundred feet. Um, and stretching it in one go, we just panelized it. But it meant that if it failed, you had to replace the whole piece. I mean, right. you, you can sew it back together with wire, but ultimately it's easier just to unhook it and put a new piece in because mm. it's so cheap. And, um, and that, but that took, I think, three years to get approved. And finally oh. it got put into, and now chain link fence is back in, the bridge department of the department of transportation because we we've, we've been able to make it work well basically we've we've managed to take a standard very very basic product mm -hmm. and make it um have an attractive transparency that was ordinarily not there, there because it was used used effectively to keep people out or in or whatever um and and not really you know motorway type or highway type uh, fencing and whereas, um, you know, we, we, we converted into this object that was handled delicately, but purposefully in, in the way it was mm. uh, applied. So that, that's a sort of, um, 
with, with approach that you you wouldn't get because it's it's sort of having that vision of of taking a material and, and reusing it in a different way. How do, how do you, with these types of projects, then define the scope of the work that you're going to be doing with certain, with certain clients? And are you at risk of, you know, do you ever, do you ever struggle with like the, the scope creeping or is, or actually do you find yourself working on one sort of one product or one part of the, of the scheme? And then you're like, you know, there's a good potential here for us to be able to design x y and z of this as well so you can kind of be strategic of you know we need to be doing all of this as opposed to just this one product and maybe simon you can well, when we get i mean to owen's point what he was saying earlier is being at the table and in and, and being in terms of a bid process or whatever early on in the process we sort of shake out the scope items and generally what we'll do right. is we'll put together a menu so to speak, of, of things that we've identified through the, either the renderings or the project documents, the scope of work, the design criteria, whatever's been established for the bid. And we'll say, we think we could do these things. We could lead on these things. We could advise on these other things. We could be in a supporting role, um, which could be advisory or reviewing documents or something mm. like that and, and proposing because sometimes people think they're going to design something or that, in, and we might say in the reverse, side, we know a product that exists that can sort of solve this problem. Like you don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel either. Cause like, as we were saying, you're, you're going to be reinventing a lot anyway, just in terms of building, building, building. Yeah. That can happen when we're early on. When what also happens is that sometimes we get brought on, let's say, midstream. So things are happening. There's this realization in the project team, and it comes back to relationships that we have and people who know us or word of mouth or what have you. People will say, we should get Billings Jackson involved with X. And then sort of once we show and demonstrate our medal, then sometimes other things sort of come out of that. They say, well, actually, I don't, I don't know if we should be designing the sign system. Like these, these guys did it pretty well and, and it's looking good and the clients bought in. Maybe they should do that. Or, you know, there's this other thing that's come out. So sometimes we end up sort of trading horses, you know, our right. menu or we, we thought we should maybe do these things. They say, no, we have that covered, but there's this other set of things that, that you should potentially look at and work on. So it sort of also depends, and I mean, I know that's not a great answer, is it depends, um, but, but it, it, it does come down to what our relationship with, the, with, let's say, the prime you know, architect or the engineer or whomever is sort of we're working with is sort of what their expertise is, um, what other consultants are at play, um, because we do a lot of work, let's say, with a landscape architect to develop things that go in the ground. Uh, we do mm. work a lot with lighting consultants to help them realize the lighting vision um, by, because we have a lot of experience in developing lighting and working with the hardware of lighting as well as sort of the technology. So it sort of depends on what the building demand is or what the demand of the, the infrastructure project is. What are the, what are the skills that are already there yeah. and sort of what are the gaps? But generally speaking, we come up with a, a scope of work and we sort of agree that or, or not, you know, to some extent and that we do find that that scope generally grows because of the demands uh, these days, especially it seems like, um, projects are getting bigger, but the schedules are getting shorter. Um, and so we then become another hand on the pump, you know, where we can produce a lot of work in a short period of time. Mm. Um, once we've gained the confidence of the, the design team and, and really more importantly, the, the client. Got it. Um, I'm interested to hear a little bit about the, the culture of the, of the practice of the, of the office um, and how, how you've gone about well, first of all, how you're operating internationally and how that how that works, and uh, we can touch upon a little bit about the sort of the impact of uh, that pesky virus that we've got that's been going around. How, yeah. So how 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 do you how do you guys work? Can you perhaps start by describing the current anatomy of the business? Well, I I, I guess the current anatomy has been dissected by COVID nineteen. So. Um, I, I guess that the, the the main thing is we're very flat, and I um, and because we've uh, honed our sort of skills in collaborating with very co large project teams, um, 
that I think that has made us a flat company. So the only the only thing that's important is the idea and delivering it, mm. right? And and as Simon said, we we don't like to draw until we know what we're going to draw. Um, it, I think one of the things that we try not to do is optioneer because ultimately the path of optioneering is emotional as well as practical. And if the more emotion you put into it, the less practical you'll end up being because you close doors earlier than you should. And it's only about choice and stuff. So, um, so actually understanding the problem is really crucial. Um, so that being said, we're a flat company. So everyone gets to work on, on most projects. And since we've been under COVID-19 constraints, we've actually become a flatter, more integrated company because we, we now meet in this manner, you know, on, on Zoom regularly talking about all projects together. And it's actually brought a lot more, um, a, a lot better communication and less time traveling into work and stuff. So mm -hmm. I can't say that I know what next year or the year after will be like in, in the way the firm furniture, I'm oh, sorry, where, where the fir firm works, but you know, we have Owen is, is based in Portugal. I'm based in West Michigan. Simon's in Chicago. We have an office in New York and an office in London. And, um, uh, we've not had, we've not met with a problem where we had not been able to fulfill the demands of clients who are in Switzerland, Saudi Arabia, um, California, um, uh, you know, etc. because of our location and our team being split. Mm. That, that being said, we've had to operate in a kind of odd way recently but I, as i said it's been quite positive in bringing uh, what i would say the london office and the new york office has been less less distinct because we now all meet in the same uh, same realm um and uh, it's been really quite positive in that respect um, how, how many are there in total we're what are we now i think we're about are we double digits? I think we're nine now. So we're, we're, we're very small. <laughs> Got it. Got it. Yeah, we, so, were, we, were, we were 14. Uh, and then we, we had some natural people naturally uh, went off to do other things. We had a couple of people in New York, architects and industrial designers that mm. uh, when, we, when we finished the um, Metro system went off on slightly different paths. Uh, and it was weirdly coincident, which is just before the whole COVID thing kicked off. And so we had, we, we have a little bit of flex where we bring people in young architects or young designers. Um, and in London, we had a couple of terrific uh, young designers that um, were equally, equally driven. Like the, the, the guys working on the Metro, that was a night and day job. I mean, they, <laughs> they were just head down. It was tough stuff. Uh, and then we weirdly got this huge contract through City ID. We do a lot of work with this fantastic uh, company that's um, an expert in <coughs> planning and wayfinding and systems. And they they gave us uh, an opportunity to work in Moscow quite yeah. a few years back. Um, and we so we we had a couple we had a couple of uh, young architects. They were they were part twos who worked for us who wanted to learn about industrial design and learn about our how we work. And they learned, they did learn, they, they had to go and live in <laughs> Moscow for, 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 I don't know how long it was, it was a couple of months. I, I was going backwards and forwards. Um, and they were true, amazing, you know, they just, they loved the experience of this, you know, extraordinary city. And they loved what they were learning about detail. And they both now work for top architects in terms of them. Um, delivering detail, one in Foster's and one in Western Williamson. Mm. Um, and and uh, so all, we, we, have, we have a somewhat transitory group of people, so if you're, you're talking about the anatomy, uh, who come through and are a little bit project specific. Um, but mo uh, most people stay with us for quite a while, yeah. quite a long, longer than probably they wanted. <laughs> so so, so is, every, is everybody working on this, the same projects or do you kind of split it up and say, look, these 
this is you guys are prioritized on this project we'll give a lead to someone who's appropriate either i mean there's a bit of geography involved and then there's, there's a right. there's experience too um and then we will and then we will have the, the backup in terms of the delivery can be from anywhere depending yeah. on the most appropriate person well i think one of the things that we started to do which is to draw on the the whole company's experience in workshops so we don't um when it was location based we tended not to share information as freely it, you know and this is not about delivery this is just about basically starting from the beginning and getting everyone around the table and that's been something we've been able to do a lot more of um because of the nature that no one is in the same room and also, actually, with our clients, it's been interesting. Right at the beginning, I figured that if, if our own company was going to be struggling with interacting and being isolated, it made sense that our clients were going to have the same experience. And so we, yes. we said, hey, why don't we uh, set up a weekly meeting to talk about nothing other than how you're doing? And, and it was really well received. And we started having these, you know, basically more contact with our clients. And we were having these sort of set piece um, meetings where we actually got on an airplane. Mm. There's quite interesting dynamic change there um, as well. But yeah, we, we've, um, we, we, we work in these two realms that have come together, which is classic industrial design for manufacturers, but in the building industry of, in relation to the related product. How? And then obviously and then working basically on projects to bring this different skill. It is a different skill set yeah. because you look at the way things go together from a manufacturing point of view. It, the closest I would say is when an architect in a large architectural practice mm -hmm. starts to specialize in facade design and you know, those people, they do it. And then eventually they might even end up working for an engineering firm that does facade design. So that that's the closest you get. And it's, that's possible, I think, in architectural mm. practices because of the value of the contract for the facade of a building. Yeah. But if you're thinking about a few benches down Broadway, it just, it's, you know, it has to be within the context of how mm. we operate. And that's slightly different. It, it, does it ever happen? You have industrial designers then working in house for larger practices and having teams of, or it's always, it's typically yeah. an independent. No, no, there's, yeah. a, there's, there's a history of, of um, industrial designers working within practices that are very common in Italy, actually, because they, they, right. they often run at a very different um, work streams. Um, but in, in the UK, say, Foster, we, we, often, we would often come up against Foster's industrial design team in, in competing, you know, for, yeah. for work. Um, that would be a typical. Um, but what's interesting about... Uh, what we what we're doing because because it's the heart of our business we don't have buildings projects mm. you know, we don't have we don't anything else this is what we do uh so we're slightly different and and what's interest I, th I think norman foster very cleverly understands the value of design on that level on that product level yes uh, as it relates to his practice and it is very much about um bringing his philosophy on the buildings to the object. It's very much about his brand. And he's been very careful not to make mistakes with some other, I mean, as an architect, you could design a, a loo, for example. You will be asked, you know, and, and, and uh, if you're prominent enough. And if, it's, if that's not a comfortable fit or a nice loo uh, to use, um, that's pretty bad, you know, for, <laughs> for you who has, you know, 25 years of building incredible, you know, you might have built skyscrapers and you know, airports and, and, and then this one object that you, you weren't quite focused on, you know, you let it slip through the, the weeds, uh, could be really damaging to your, to your reputation stupidly. Well, it, it's it's so know. interesting because it, it is, it's, yeah. it's literally where you have a very kind of physical connection with the building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's right. Just, and I, I, the one thing I loved about Nick Grimshaw when I first, you know, Duncan and I had our first meetings with him, he was, he was obsessed with the little elements, you know, like mm. you could only use a certain tap and it wasn't for aesthetic reasons. It was because he had other taps. They hadn't worked. 
And he would get phone calls for about buildings that were 25 stories tall, and it was just the tap that was the problem. The client was going mental. Mm. Um, so he, he was, you know, he was sort of, that, that attention to detail came out of those conversations with him. Uh, in a way how 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 do you guys um set up the roles within the business so as a sort of a leadership team is there somebody who's more focused on you know uh, client acquisition and business development and then there's somebody who's kind of head of more head of the design or is it a kind of everybody's doing everything how do you guys differentiate and and separate roles you want to duncan did duncan does uh, all the hard stuff (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> no it, it, well i mean i think that you know it's been or, organic in the sense of the responsibilities but you know i've been doing my own thing for a couple of years when owen joined we joined mm. as a partnership with no partnership agreement and that's nearly 30 years on so we obviously got on and um we 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 actually did split work up well, as and when it's necessary to do, and also who is most efficient at doing it. And um, we ended up with two two jurisdictions. Obviously, you've got the US and the, the UK. And Simon's, um, you know, allowed us to expand in the U- US because of my sort of, as it were, kind of running the business side. And so we have, generally, we all have a role of, of acqu- acquiring new business so when we're out there everyone even you know if someone goes to an exhibition in philadelphia for the lighting industry it, they will be trying to get make connections and create relationships all that that's part of understanding i guess it's our natural curiosity of of object mm-hmm. and people um because you know getting something made is always about the person not about the machine okay yeah <laughs> so so um and so that naturally allows us to, so that's a sort of, in a way, the flatness of the company is represented. But if you wanted to say, well, who's the, who does the accounts and make sure they get submitted? Well, there's one person, that's me. And, you know, and who, who makes sure that we communicate well and we're, we're sending the right message? And that's, you know, Owen, Owen and Simon, you know, because we're in two different jurisdictions, there is subtle differences of mm. operating. Um, you know, in, in Europe and in, uh, in the U S and so, uh, and then underneath, as I said, people bring, bring stuff up and, and say, Oh, I met this person. Should we follow up? And we organize a meeting and something happens or something doesn't, but it's very, uh, we like to feel like we're our entrepreneurial. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, right from the beginning, the entrepreneurial thing was, you know, Owen and I thinking that there was something that could be done in the building industry to bring the different approach. And it's not a, it's not an, it's not instead of, and this is what I think is important. It's, it's an, it's an additional service. And, and it's just like, there was no such thing as facade engineering 30 years ago, right? Mm-hmm. It was, it was a sort of complex relationship between architectural vision and manufacturer's ability to deliver. Yeah, that role has been created and it's had value because of the ability to deliver quality facades that don't fail are reliable because a leaky building is really expensive. Yeah. And, and so um, in terms of the way we operate, industrial design is something that I feel like we have brought to the table in relation to it being an, a consulting service rather than an adjunct yeah. or whatever that it actually is itself a service that can provide added value to the mm. manufacture and delivery of buildings and the design of those and the urban, you know, the context of actually touching space, being in space as seeing as a product, a commercial product to sell to the person who's experiencing that rather than a facility that, that is sort mm. of more generally designed. Um, so it's, it's getting into that, that independent user I think it's like you were saying earlier, it's, it's a holistic approach. 
like you're kind of you're, you're being very aware of all the different touch points where you're you're you've got quite a unique position within the within the design process and the consultant team where you are kind of you've got the ability to marry uh, and be the sort of the focal point of many different stakeholders and consultants well, um, you know what's what's interesting is that um it's made me you know from what owen and duncan have been saying too is that it's it's unfortunate that a lot of times those critical interaction points, whether it's a doorknob, a table, a bench, you know, the things that actually people touch and interact with within a building, like mm. Owen, Duncan gave the example of Owen talking about a doorknob, you know, and that's your first, is that that, that sort of left to, I mean, it's to, to the thing for Nick Grimshaw, a faucet that was specified. The architect or the designer has no control over it. They've specified a product and then, but that's the thing that he's getting calls about is a thing that to was totally out of his control, right? That he specified and that that's the thing that's giving him problems. You know, it's not the windows are leaking or this, you know, it, and it's a very low cost. It's a very low bar and low cost to be able to improve the person's experience of a building and all of the energy and intellect that's gone into making a structure can fall down because the doorknobs creaky or the faucet's leaky, or the bench isn't comfortable. It seems like it's, it's sort of when you think about it in those terms, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like that those are the objects that should be thought of first, or, or that the energy should be gone into investing in those objects, mm. um, because they're the ones who are going to have the tactility feedback. Those are the things that are going to resonate with somebody at a very personal level. Mm. Um, and so I think that's, that's, the struggle that we have sometimes is communicating the value of that. It's just really interesting that you, you say that actually, that because there's a kind of asymmet an asymmetrical response in some of those, in those, you know, the products, the touch points of a building. You know, I know if I ever go to somebody's house and they've just had a new extension done and they want to show the architect, Oh, what do you, what do you think of this? They will always go straight to a complaint about a light switch or something that the architect probably didn't have anything to do with and like, oh, this i can't believe it but it's it's those kind of emotive points that actually yeah they, they kind of end up governing almost asymmetrically somebody's experience of of, yeah. the, of the building and there's and they're really and it's a really inexpensive thing right yeah. and it's really a low like i said low hanging yeah. fruit to be able to do that well and it doesn't cost anymore because you're going to be investing in those objects anyway mm. right if you're going to get a switch from wherever or you know it but it is interesting that like you're saying like it all falls down because you go do you know the the hardware store you know at a last minute because you forgot the plate covers you know for this light switch or you know the thing didn't come so you went to the hardware store to buy the actual the outlet and when you push it in you know everybody hates an outlet when you push it in and it keeps going you know like it's not <laughs> supported just weird weird things like that that i mean that's not what billings jackson de design does but it is these little things that make a, it, a huge difference, an inordinate, inordinate amount of, of importance relative yes. to the cost. And it's- Yeah, and, and I, I would say this, this thing is, that everyone's talking about how much, you know, like a wayfinding system, you're talking about a glass and stainless steel object and how much does it cost? And then no one, ever, no one ever questions the cost of it put, being put in the ground, right? Like the guy digging the hole has a free pass you know, uh, and it, you know, and, and so you, you kind of going, well, 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 what about, can we innovate in that process? Oh no, you know, we can't mess with the way people dig holes in the ground. Never. And, and so, um, yeah, it's three times as much as the object that you're buying to, to above the ground. Right. I mean, I, I, I kind of, um, that, that aspect of the labor attributed to an object. So you buy mm. a light fitting and it costs, three or four times as much as the light fitting to put it into a building. And, you know, so yeah, of course we end up working on a product where we save 50% of the time it took to install. And that's, that was his only, you know, that's, that made that product the best selling product in mm -hmm. Europe for, for the last 20 years. So it's, it's, um, it's, in, it's interesting because the, 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 those, those sort of elements that, that, either make a product successful or not in the building industry are, are crucial. And coming back to that point in terms of the touch points, what we were introduced to a, an urban planner, but uh, I mean, he's not, he, a, a, a 
a guru, as it were, from mm. back in the 60s and 70s, a guy called Kevin Lynch. And we were introduced to his work by uh, City ID. But his, his idea of basically comfort and being uh, um, kind of aware of where you are in terms of, in, and this goes into wayfinding, but what he was trying to articulate, he articulated very well, was that people's ability to basically live their lives and everything are geared to their being free in their minds to think about things they want to do rather than things they don't want to do. And this is where wayfinding, right? You, you can spend all this money on a beautiful building, but if nobody can get around it, they're never going to look at the architecture. They're just mm. going to be worried about getting on the train or plane or whatever. And so this whole concept of having a mental map of, of a building that's derived from the human context, not the master planning thing. It's like, what am I doing? Where am I moving? Now, those notions go through and, and wayfinding is the thing at the end that you have to have if those things don't work. But that's, that's the sort of process that, say, wayfinding designers can apply at the beginning of a project when they're planning yeah. it, right? Not solving the problems that weren't solved at the end. And I say, I would say that those are the things where the budget for signage is the thing that always gets cut at the end because it hasn't been procured and there's no money left. And <laughs> that's the one thing that's going to help you make your building successful. So that, mm. those are the type of things where this asymmetry of importance of, yeah. of use and experience and architecture are, are kind of, uh, and it's interesting because as I said, facade designers have come in. There are more consultants that kind of specialized in the as absolute, absolute performance of the building at, from a big, from the beginning of the design rather than at the end. And do, do, I, you know, so in, in this case, do you work closely then with some of the, the curators of the brand in some of, in some of the large infrastructure projects or some of the corporate corporate companies? Cause obviously you, you're in a way uh, a quite an well, a very important custodian, if you like, of the brand experience that lots of these businesses are are putting forwards, and that's where a lot of this value kind of uh, comes from. Is that is that a conversation that you're involved with a lot? Then is working with with the with brand yeah. experience and yes, yeah. I mean, I'd say that the key key one that we. I don't know if we can talk about. Can we talk? We can't talk about that one, can we? So, uh, but but basically, the the application. Well, what I would say is is that right from the culture in our firm, we're about successful products, right? Mm. In, in the in the sense of saying, well, what's successful for us is something that is repeated and sold frequently when we have royalties. But we have the same philosophy in relation to the building, which is, you know, we're not here to put a brushstroke of our our sort of style onto something. We want the, the actual performance of the material and then the object and the client, all of those things to be, to be the most successful they can be within the budget they have to deliver what we're doing. And therefore, we're not going to basically re in, reintroduce something that already exists that performs well. We, we would say if that's not performing well, then we should redo it. But if it's performing well, then we will say, well, what can we do to enhance that performance in, mm. the, in the role of what we're doing? And that, you know, whether that's the um, improvement, station improvements in New York City, where you, you had the guiding hand of, of um, now you're going to have to remind me, Simon, uh, graphic designer for the New York City. Oh, Vignelli. Vignelli's, you know, beautiful, sort of simple, approach to the whole communication the the accidental line that's at the top <laughs> so that, that was d derived from the manufacturing of the object that became an identity through the station yeah. and that was then you know redoing the stations was the reapplication of that and the design team it wasn't our choice it was the design team came to that conclusion that there was no merit in reworking it but then going through to doing some of the other equipment that's going into the stations we've carried that sort of the um, drive of that simple communication of form and, and material and when it's launched we can tell you what it is <laughs> so. <laughs> fabulous fabulous um just to kind of start to con conclude um 30 years working together what have been what how 
how, what, what are some of the keys to making a relationship work for that long? Because it's no easy task to be able to, you know, it is like a marriage, you know, then it, it's, there's a number of people involved. What have been the, the sort of... I, I, had, to, I had to leave the country. <laughs> <laughs> long yeah. distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I yeah. think, uh, you know what Being I would say? Part. I think, and this comes right from the first moment of, of basically, the only thing that matters is the idea and and it being the best it can be and mm. and and in some respects owen and i have a a characteristic which is that we can be incredibly um i guess disparaging of one another's ideas if we think they're not very good and for outside honest, people to honest, watch it's like honest. how do you ever <laughs> how, how do you ever speak again right um yes. but, but because because we're only talking about the ideas uh, we're not talking about you know personal characteristics of people it is it, it's water off the duck's back and and you know that's from our point of view it's really a passion for the ideas and and making them and you know you get frustrated when you can't get what you think is the the right idea through but then you have to walk past that and you you go past that and then get get on to the next um decision and, and 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 model but ultimately and this all comes down to what is your role as a designer is to make the object that you're working on whether it's a building uh, uh, a shoe a car whatever yeah. it's to be successful and in terms of the current environment to make it as sustainable as possible that it's not a frivolous you know. Let me say something from a from an outside perspective. Um, <laughs> well, Simon's obviously got used to our abilities. Of no, no, but but it. you know, so so to go back to I think like how is the what is the company and how is I you know I shared some CVs the other day for a project and the people looked at it and go that must be a really great place to work because all the CVs it was like Duncan Owen Aiden and myself and we've all been there for you know a long time. I'm probably the newest addition. I am the newest addition to that group of people um, where you have, you know, people have been together for like 30 years. Aiden's been with them almost since the beginning, you know, 20 some odd years. Um, so, but what I, what I think actually looking at both Duncan and Owen, one of the characteristics that they both share um, is that they never hold too fast to an idea either. Mm -hmm. So how they said they, they, you can, they, they're open to be criticized. And again, like it's not a personal attack, but also, you know, Duncan and Owen, especially I think more so Duncan will, will say, will have an idea and be very strong on that idea. But then if you point out that it's not the right idea or there's some flaw in it, he just automatically goes to the next idea, right? Like there's no, there's no, um, um, sort of, um, what ego or, is it? or yeah. ego yeah. about like, Oh, well that was my idea or that was a really good idea. It, mm -hmm. it works yeah. or it doesn't work. And so I think that as a firm, we do that, but that's sort of as a, the, the genesis of that is sits with the, these two here and that they're not precious about their ideas. Again, it's about the best solution and it doesn't matter who came up with it or whatever else. And I think it's, we're all open to be criticized and to, to work on it, not in terms of trying to, you know, um, fling mud, but just to get the best, the best ideas out. And a lot of times it is through a collaboration. It's not really one person that's, you know, the auteur who's coming down from on high and, and delivering a perfectly realized design that it really is about having an idea but then that idea needs to be vetted and enhanced and, and work through. And, and most designers, I think, work like that. But I, I, I was sort of taken by the lack of preciousness in a way of, of like, you know, an idea is an idea. It's about realizing it and does it work. Mm. And that's, I think, I think that that's why they sort of can, they've, they've worked so well together for all that, that time is that it doesn't get personal. It's about the, 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 end, the end result. Brilliant. And just one, Thank you, Simon. <laughs> one, one final question. Um, what would you say to your, to yourself? And this is for all, all three of you. And what would you say to your, to yourself 30 years ago about at uh, the beginnings or the earlier stages of your, of your careers, one piece of advice. I think stick, stick to it. You got to have a, have a sort of vision and stick to it that, that what we formulated together, all of, all of us, including Aiden and people that worked with us before and left, is we really believe 
we were excited about designing products, things, mm -hmm. objects that you could sit on and touch and walk around. I, I designed a couple of buildings. I'm so glad I did that uh, to, because the scale of it. But I'm also so glad that I don't do it because it's not what I want to do. And it's, it's, it is having a passion and follow your passion, follow. And so, I, yeah, I think, I think that if, if, if Duncan and I made any mistakes along the way, we would probably might have done more stuff on our own earlier or, but I, I don't know. I don't feel, I don't, I don't have any regrets. We had a, we've had a lot of fun and done some really good stuff, but we, because we've stuck to it and worked with great people, you know, with Simon included. And, uh, I, I would say that there's never, uh, in and this is, I mean, obviously you have to close the door in making a decision to move forward. Right. Mm. And, you know, I know it's always, it's never too late to make changes if you can make change. But what I would say is that I, I think that um, the more people you bring to the table in creating ideas can only enrich the idea. And that, um, so sharing information early, mm. and this, we tell this to our clients, share the brief. We want to know if the brief is worth doing, you know, like sort of thing. Um, so sharing information early, and um, not thinking that there has to be a process, a point at which you get to before you can hand it over. Uh, it's a bit like you can get free work by just sharing this idea with someone. And then we don't want you to do anything. Just think about it. Uh, you know, and of course, that if you, if you, the more experience you have, the more thoughts you will have in your sleep almost about ideas, right? Mm. So I think that, that in, if I was to say anything, it would have been to be, it's taken me this long to be as open as I am, right? You know, in a way. So, so I'd say if I'd been open and, and more and more kind of reached out to more people and been, I guess, less, yeah, I just say more, be open. And, and, I, and the other thing about it is, and this is not, this is a piece of advice is an idea is only as good as its ability to be realized. Okay. Mm. And that's, so when you have a great idea, don't think about the idea anymore. Think about how it would be realized and what mm. you need to do in order to do that. And if you're up for that, then do it. If you can't do that, then don't worry about the idea anymore and get on to the next thing. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you very much. And Simon, any? <sighs> um, I probably would have drawn less door schedules and, and bathroom schedules and things like that. Um, you know, just do, do less of that. Like not, not don't, I've actually taken a sort of a non-typical route, um, yeah. in my career, but, um, I think that, you know, I, when I was younger, I thought I needed to work for a big company and, and sort of tick those boxes. And in some ways I have, and in some ways I haven't, but I think I would have, I, I, I don't think you need to. Um, and I don't think, I think that actually finding the thing that you like to do and trying to keep doing that as much as you can. And if that means staying in the same place or going someplace else, then that's what you should do. Like, I think that it, you you will, your passion is rewarded. You know, if something that takes your attention and is, you think it's valuable, then I think you will do your best work and it will result in reward. If you sort of think you need to conform or, or do something to fill up your resume or do something like that, I don't, I don't think that kind of ever works out as, as well as, as, as you think it might. So. Fantastic. Gentlemen, thank you so much uh, for your contribution this afternoon. I have thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed speaking with you and asking you all these questions. Thanks, Thanks for having us. Thanks very much, Rin. No, it's really, uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't get many occasions to talk about our unusual and special peculiarities. <laughs> That's <was> quite <laughs> a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks, Rin. My pleasure. And that's a wrap. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast 
at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.